Hello everyone. Today we're going to be taking a look at the biomechanics and the anatomy of the temporomandibular joint. Now, why is it we want to even consider the TMJs? It seems that it's relatively uncommon uh, for dysfunction in the outpatient orthopedic clinic. Uh, well, one, uh, we use it regularly with chewing, swallowing, talking. Uh, so Throughout the day, the joint is used much more than people realize, therefore potentially putting it at risk to some sort of exposure, uh, but also showing its importance. Uh, additionally, uh, there is a connection to the cervical spine and pain coming from there that we'll get to a little bit later. And with the cervical spine being the, one of the most common sources of pain for physical therapy, uh, we want to know all aspects of managing care there. So we're gonna start with going through just the osteokinematics, you know, some of the language uh, for, for what we're gonna be talking about. Uh, so initially we have depression, which is opening of the mouth. Typically it's an average about 50 millimeters or three PIP knuckles, as you can see in the picture there. Uh, if someone can only get less than two PIP knuckles, in their mouth that would be deemed abnormal. Now, opening or, or depression of the mouth uh, typically has two phases, uh, both a translation and a rotation. And if you can get a good amount of motion just from the rotation aspect, but to get full motion, you need translation. And we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Elevation is just the opposite of depression. It's just closing the mouth. Uh, you have overjet, three to six millimeters, and overbite, one quarter to one third of the height of the mandibular uh, central incisor. So overjet is how far the top teeth are forward relative to the bottom teeth when we're looking at the central incisors. Um, this is probably the term most people are, are thinking of, or they're thinking of overbite when in reality, the measurement that they're, they're contemplating or considering is over jet. Over bite is how much vertical uh, surface of the uh, mandibular central incisor is covered. Protrusion is when you push your jaw forward, uh, should be about six to nine millimeters, and retrusion is the opposite where it goes backwards, three millimeters. This protrusion re retrusion, uh, it corresponds to the translation aspect of the uh, arthrokinematics of the TMJ that we'll cover in a little bit. Uh, oh, depression and elevation is more the rotation. Minimal rotation occurs for either protrusion or retrusion, which is why uh, it's, it's the tra translation aspect. Lateral excursion is where the mandible is jutted to the side of, of the mouth. Uh, typically, it's about 11 millimeters of unilateral excursion or about a, a quarter of the motion that, that the individual has for depression. You name it by the direction that the, the mandible is pushed towards, and it's possible it will be asymmetrical, which can be a sign of dysfunction. So the TMJ, some anatomy review here, consists of the mandibular condyle down here the articulator or articular disc, and then the mandibular fossa coming into the articular eminence. Now there's both a superior synovial joint and an inferior synovial joint. So the superior is between the, the superior aspect of the articular disc and the mandibular fossa, while the inferior is between the inferior aspect of the articular disc and the mandibular condyle. You can palpate it by feeling just in front of the opening of your ear or the external acoustic meatus. Now the mandibular condyle is convex with medial and lateral projections. So you can see a little bit of that in these pictures here. Um, and it has an axis between the condyles that intersects about 160 degrees. When you're opening and closing the mouth, that motion you feel is the lateral uh, projection of the condyle. 
Now, the surface of the condyle is covered with fibrocartilage. Now, <clears throat> now that is important because fibrocartilage absorbs forces much better than hyaline, and so it has a better reparative feature. That's especially important because uh, when, when speaking with different uh, TMJ specialists, they talk of how great the TMJ is at self-healing, often meaning that surgery is for remodeling the TMJ is, is typically unnecessary. So when looking at the mandibular fossa, you have the non-articular surface, which is a thin layer of bone or fibrocartilage in the posterior and superior aspect of the dome. And then you have the articular surface. That includes the articular eminence in the anterior aspect of the fossa covered by thick fibrocartilage. So there's not much weight bearing or force transmission going through the non-articular aspect, uh, but the articular surface is, is built up a little stronger and, and ready to absorb some force. It has an, the articular surface has an average angle of about 55 degrees from the horizontal plane, which impacts the ki kinematics of the TMJ motion. Because the non-articular surface is much thinner and not ready for that load bearing, it is at risk of injury. So if someone were to fall and their jaws kind of pushed posterior uh, superiorly, uh, it's possible you could uh, have a fracture in that region. So here's another picture of that. Here's your non-articular surface, and then here's the articular surface. So again, if that force pushes the condyle posteriorly and superiorly, you could uh, potentially have an injury. So when looking at the articular disc, we have it can be broken into three sections. You have the convex superiorly and concave inferiorly. Uh, intermediate portion is flat superiorly and concave inferiorly, and then the anterior portion is slight concavity superiorly and flat inferiorly. And it is all made of fibrocartilage. Aside from the periphery, it typically lacks blood supply and innervation, uh, but again, because of the fibrocartilage, it is pretty good at uh, self. Um, healing. It's relatively firm but flexible. Uh, it is attached to the capsule. The posterior portion attaches to the retrodiscal lamina which connects to bone. That space is filled with fat, blood vessels, and sensory nerves which is why pain can be felt there. The lamina also typically attaches to the tympanic plate and mandible. So we don't necessarily have the pictures of those uh, fibers coming coming through here, but it would be in this general region. The anterior region attaches to the neck of the mandible and anterior capsule. The superior head of the uh, LP and the temporal bone anterior to the articular eminence. Thickness varies throughout, but it, at its thinnest intermediate portion, it is about one millimeter thick. Here's another picture of that. The dimple helps keep the disc between the anterior superior edge of the condyle and the articular eminence, kind of like right through there. This helps protect the condyle as it slides forward. That's why we have the concavity there. Disc maximizes congruency within the TMJ to decrease contact pressure and add stability. So remember, if we have more contact throughout, there is more force dispersion and, and the disc doesn't take up excessive strain in one area. Now, getting to the, the more uh, soft tissue aspects, the fibrous capsule is loose fitting and synovial lined. It is firm, medial and lateral, and it lacks anterior and posterior. So when you think of the TMJ mobility, we want to have a good amount of uh, flexibility anterior and posterior so that you can have that the primary motion, depression and elevation. Medial and lateral uh, stability uh, makes it so it's less likely to have any abnormal and excessive motion. But anteriorly, the fibrous capsule still attaches to the superior head of the lateral pterygoid and inferiorly attaches to the disc and the neck of the mandibular condyle. 
the lateral ligament, the primary ligament reinforcing the TMJ, made up of deep horizontal and superficial oblique fibers. The oblique fiber attachment is important for TMJ because that's what kind of like kicks in that uh, translation. The primary function is to stabilize the lateral side of the TMJ. Now the horizontal fibers go horizontally and posteriorly and the oblique fibers go anterior and superior. We also have to consider the stylomandibular and sphenomandibular ligaments uh, they, as they are accessory ones, but they do help suspend the mandible from the cranium. So here you can kind of see a picture of some of those, but as you would have depression of the mandible, you would have a, a, a pull from some of these fires forward as well. Now getting on to the arthrokinematics. Movement requires action of bilateral TMJs. If you have one that's blocked, the other side should not be able to move much or, or will significantly be impacted as far as the motion goes. The arthrokinematics require both rotation and translation for proper mechanics as well. Rotation occurs within the condyle on the inferior aspect of the death disc and translation occurs as the condyle and disc move forward on the man mandibular fossa and articular eminence. Now, if uh, we do have a restriction on one side compared to the other, over time, that repetitive motion could lead to some wear and tear in a sense. Not that the, that's uh, necessarily the, the end of the world as the disc can have some good self-healing uh, aspects as well. So uh, looking at protrusion first, if we are just speaking about protrusion, that is an anterior translation of the condyle disc on the mandibular fossa with almost no rotation occurring. Retrusion occurs with posterior translation of the condyle disc on the mandibular fossa. Uh, each of those is necessary for uh, full end range motion of uh, depression and elevation. Uh, Lateral excursion is the side-to-side -side translation of the condyle and disc on the fossa. The ipsilateral condyle has minimal motion while the contralateral condyle translates anteriorly and medially. The one condyle kind of acts as like a, a pivot point on the ipsilateral side. When looking at depression, this is the big one as far as trying to break it into the different phases. The early phase is the first 35 to 50%, and that's where the condyle rolls posteriorly on the inferior surface of the disc with a slight anterior translation. Think of our convex concave roll. The late phase, the final 50 to 65%, uh, transitions to motion primarily consisting of condyle and disc translating anteriorly on the mandibular fossa and articular eminence. The, this role and translation in reality occurs simultaneously. However, you have a different ratio of the rolling versus the sliding uh, in the early phase and late phase. The axis of rotation is constantly changing because of the combination of movement. Um, you can palpate for when that translation occurs. So if again, you're placing your finger on the external acoustic meatus just an anterior to that, and that initial part of your depression, you should feel it's sitting under your fingers, but then as you open your mouth wider, you should feel it start to shift a little bit forward. Now the disc stays between the condyle and the eminence to minimize stress. Protrusion and depression are typically limited by ret retrodiscal lamina being stretched by the attachment to the disc. And it's the tension in the retrodiscal lamina that initiates uh, elevation which is just the reverse mechanics of depression. So here you can kind of see some of the mechanics occurring. So you have some of that initial depression occurring here with some rotation and then the late phase you start to have some translation occurring through here. There, here's the tension on the retrodiscal lamina. All right, let's see if this play will play.
you can see initially you're getting the mechanics here oh, rolling and then a little translation and then the translation comes back there interestingly they show the translation as a completely secondary motion here with elevation in reality typically you get a little bit more of the retrusion before um, you see all the rotation Now here's another video that shows uh, what's happening closer up. Uh, here's your conda, articular eminence, disc running through here. Watch. Then here we go. Here's more of that translation. Good. As you can see how they do happen together, the rotation and depression and translation. But yeah, mostly that elevation occurs initially. Yeah. All right, so now moving on to uh, some of the muscles, the muscular anatomy. There are four primary muscles and then some accessory ones as well. So uh, initially here we have the masseter, which is responsible for, for when acting bilaterally, elevation with a slight protrusion. Uh, unilaterally, uh, it is responsible for ipsilateral excursion. The temporalis, when acting bilaterally, uh, performs elevation with a slight retrusion, which helps with the, the arthrokinematics of the TMJ, if we think about that rotation with translation. Uh, unilaterally also helps with like, little unilateral excursion. The, uh, if you are thinking of the muscular attachments, origins, and insertions, it makes it really easy to understand what the actions would be when acting both bilaterally and unilaterally, especially if you have like a three-dimensional image of, of how that muscle runs. Uh, you can typically palpate these. Your uh, masseter is just below your zygomatic arch running down to the uh, inferior aspect of the uh, mandible. And if you clench your teeth, you'll feel push out. The temporalis is more in the temporal area. Same thing, if you clench your teeth, you should be able to feel it. Uh, now, these you know, ipsilateral excursions are important because when we are grinding our food, sometimes we get a little bit more side to side motion to help break it down. Think of like how a cow chews, not that we all chew like a cow, but that's the, the purpose of that. And we have the, the medial pterygoid um, when acting bilaterally, is responsible for elevation and a slight protrusion. Let's see right here. And unilaterally, it has a contralateral excursion. The lateral pterygoid, when acting bilaterally, has a strong protrusion force, and an inferior head depresses the mandible, while the superior head controls the position of the disc during elevation. When acting unilaterally, is responsible for contralateral excursion. So both uh, the pterygoids perform uh, some form of contralateral excursion when acting unilaterally, while the uh, masseter and temporalis have uh, ipsilateral. Uh, the lateral pterygoid is, is generally pretty horizontal, uh, so it has a good force for pulling the condyle anteriorly, impacting the depression. And then you can see its attachments here to the disc uh, helps explain why I can control the position during elevation. The, the lateral pterygoid is not typically palpable. Um, and the theory about its disc attachment is a little controversial, but it also does uh, attach to the capsule. And the two different heads, the, the superior head and the inferior head uh, are active in different phases of the motion. 
it's there's a balance between the pterygoids and the masseter and temporalis so that you get you limit uh, the lateral excursion at different times there the lateral pterygoid is very effective at creating some strong forces as well Now getting on to some of the secondary or the accessory muscles of mastication, we have our suprahyoids, which attach to the base of the cranium, mandible, and the hyoid bone. And the infrahyoids attach to the hyoid bone, the thyroid cartilage, the sternum, and the scapula. The suprahyoids assist in depression of the mandible. Uh, both suprahyoids and infrahyoids are involved with speech swallowing and tongue movement. Uh, the infrahyoids in general stabilize the hyoid bone, while the suprahyoids can help move the mandible. With opening of the mouth, the inferior head of the lateral pterygoid contracts to anteriorly translate the condyle. Due to a force coupled to suprahyoids, rotation of the mandible occurs around its axis as well. So, when we're thinking of that lateral pterygoid head pulling, the condyle forward with the, the simultaneous action of the superhyoids pulling down with these muscles here, that's what creates the force couple so that it overall becomes a rotation with translation. During closing the mouth, the masseter, medial pterygoid, and temporalis are responsible for elevation of the mandible, while the posterior fibers of the temporalis retrude the mandible as well. The superior head of the lateral pterygoid helps eccentrically stabilize the disc during closure. Activity of the lateral pterygoid is stronger on the involved side. That retrusion aspect is important when returning from a fully open mouth. So you can see how, based on the alignment of some of these muscles, it's primarily going to be trying to force into elevation. Um, and then you can see these posterior fibers here are going to pull a little bit more into retrusion as well. Now the retrodiscal lamina, which is back in here, not shown too well, uh, they're responsible for initiating elevation uh, when talking about the lateral pterygoid. But it, the lateral pterygoid is also good, important for balancing the retrusion force coming from those posterior fibers of the temporalis. It's the tension between the lateral pterygoid and the temporalis that helps keep the disc between the condyle and the eminence. Now, kind of what I touched on on, on one of the initial slides, there is a, a relation between the team J and the cervical spine. It is essential to assess the cervical spine in patients with temporal mandibular dysfunction and vice versa. The reason being is that they share a neural pathway. So, what we're looking at here with a trigeminal nerve has the different branches, including up to the maxillary and mandibular region. Some of those fibers come down here and actually head to their second order nucleus right here in the spinal thalamic tract, the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. Why that's important is the location of this typically can go down to C23 before heading up to the contralateral thalamus. So the nerves of the of the TMD or TMJ run as low in general as C23. So if you have some dysfunction in the upper cervical spine, you can very easily have some sort of impact or amplification of the temporal mandibular joint and vice versa. If you have some sort of uh, dysfunction in the uh, or it, pain with, related to C, the, uh, the upper cervical spine, C1 through 3, it's possible that you will then see an impact on TMJ. So asking questions about um, grinding teeth, uh, pain with, with chewing, uh, just doing a, an assessment of the uh, TMJ is it important for your, up, your neck patients and vice versa. So anytime I'm treating someone with the TMJ, you, you better believe I'm going to be addressing the upper cervical spine, at least assessing it, and vice versa. Well, that is it for our, our lecture today. Uh, we may get into, in the future, actual assessment and treatment of the TMJ 
uh, as well. But uh, hopefully this was a good review uh, for some of the understanding of the basics of the temporomandibular joint and, and the biome biomechanics and anatomy. Thank you.